ripples change the sides But never leave the stream of warm and permanent sand So the days float as they're quite aware of what they're going through I think we're going to start. I'm Greg Alvo with the Socialist Project and uh, teach uh, at the Department of Political Science at York University. Uh, today we're discussing uh, the issue of uh, the Obama presidency and the changes to the American empire. Uh, this meeting is sponsored by the Socialist Project, the International Socialists, and the Center for Social Justice. Uh, there are some publications from the various groups here as well. Uh, also, turning now to the discussion, I'll make first an apology. Leo Panitch was initially supposed to uh, speak here tonight on this topic, given that he's one of Canada's leading commentators on, on this, but uh, a close friend, Jim Littleton, who wrote a very uh, important book in the 1980s called Target Nation, Canada and the Western Intelligence Network, which was one of the first books completely examining the the linkages between Canada and CIA and so forth, recently died. Uh, and Leo was at, is at the funeral all day today. Uh, but we're very lucky to have three other very well-known activists in the labor movement to speak for it with us, th with us today on the topic of Obama. Uh, Abby Bakken uh, from the Department of Political Science at Queen's University. Ajuma Nangwaya from the CUPE labor activists and very involved in educational activist activities with CUPE. And Herman Rosenfeld who's a CAW retirer and and also teaching at Labor Studies at McMaster uh, uh, this year. Um, the election, I think, of Obama has got everybody, in one sense, very happy. And who, who wouldn't want to be celebrating getting rid of Bush <laughs> and hopefully the end of some of the worst aspects of the last eight years, uh, not only in the US, but of course around the world. And I think the second thing I guess we're all celebrating particularly uh, uh, those of us in North America, is that given the history of slavery uh, and uh, the Jim Crow, the, the Crow laws, and the rest of it, in the in the U.S., the election of an African American as as uh, president, it also is an important symbolic, but also possibly substantive change. Um, I think the third thing that's important for us right now, it also seems to signal something else in terms of the crisis of neoliberalism that has kind of been unfolding in different places in a different sectors. Uh, clearly the financial sector, a range of uh, the way that the, this is spilling over into a general economic crisis, and to some extent the repudiation so strongly of both the Republican Party, both at the level of the presidency and Congress, is also uh, raising questions of the crisis of neoliberalism. Of course, this is why we also have to assess uh, uh, the Obama presidency, because what it fits in is, of course, the power structures and general uh, social and economic inequalities that structure American society and North American politics. So we need to also be able to assess those developments. So I think that's the themes that all the speakers will address today, uh, trying to assess not only Obama himself and the presidency, but what it means for possible shifts in American power structures geopolitically, internally to the U.S. and so on. So we'll kick off with Herman speaking for 15 or 20 minutes on... <coughs> Okay, the Obama victory represents many layers and levels, some of them which uh, 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 Greg mentioned already. It was, it was a major defeat for the ultra-reactionary Republican administration of Bush and the cynical attempt to extend the reach of the Republicans to the, tick of the, to the ticket of the unfortunate John McCain and the scary Sarah Palin. And uh, every one of us who knows Americans know that so many of them got really pissed off about Bush over the years. In fact, some of you couldn't shut up. You know, people who were never political, suddenly, like my sister, suddenly, <laughs> every time you call them. Bush that might or may not make some differences in the medium and the longer term. A stunning, if mostly symbolic, breakthrough of the color barrier by electing an African-American president with the overwhelming electoral support of African-Americans and the sympathy and solidarity of people of color around the globe. But although Obama developed a novel and highly organized electoral campaign, that appeal to a diverse but not class-based coalition on a platform of change and phrases and notions that were redolent of the civil rights movement. And although his administration will differ in many important ways from that of the odious Bush Republicans, and remember, things that from a perspective of long-term change, which we call little things, mean a lot to working people and other oppressed peoples. Um, this is not likely, and I don't just mean symbolically, I mean materially. This is not likely to lead any of the kind of challenge to the power of capital, let alone to the neoliberal forms of ruling 
in the whole land, whole land of the U.S. world hegemon. It can only become part of a real movement for change if it's able to develop from below in a way that could force him and his new administration to put some content into the rhetoric of change and possibilities. Given the political and class forces currently operating in the U.S., it's not likely, although it remains possible in all kinds of ways. Obama politically is a centrist Democrat, centrist being not on the far left of, even as a liberal, uh, but not on the far right as Bush. And if he wasn't, he would not have been nominated and elected in what remains a rather evenly divided but rather socially conservative U.S. Tell me how many times have you spoke to an American and said, why didn't he talk, take this position? And said, he'd never get elected if, he'd said, if he did that. That tells you something. Okay, <clears throat> but of course, it's only one part. This is an element of contradictions and layers, and I just want to explore some of them. The political parties in the United States seek to create blocks between sections of the ruling strata and elements of the working class and other subordinate strata in order to get enough popular support to legitimate a certain set of policies that work for the ruling class. With, key, with certain elements of the ruling class see as creating the best conditions for capital accumulation. And that's what the Democratic Party did this time. But I think it was hijacked and changed by the crisis and then it rode, the party rode the wave of that crisis created. It also was linked to other things which happened. The desire for a break with the Bush administration in many ways. People were afraid of job loss. They were worried about personal community survival, losing their homes, about health care and education. The war, a lot of the people came out of the voting booths and exit and they said the war. Uh, and especially the loss of respect for the United States. For Americans, that's a big deal. The inspiration of people of color along with specific goals of capital. Limiting the crisis, cleaning up the mess, and adding the proper levels of regulation appropriate levels of regulation for them, uh, beginning the process of assessing and then restructuring U.S. economic strategies, in a hegemonic sense, restoring the effectiveness of the international neoliberal Leo order, restoring legitimacy internally and externally in ways that protect U.S. power and domination, and dealing in some way, this is from the point of view of capital, with Iraq, Afghanistan, the Middle East, and opposition in Latin America. Compared to the Republicans this time, things were different. The Republicans were saddled with the Bush legacy, in terms of unilateralism, in terms of failure in Iraq, in terms of embarrassing uh, uh, and irresponsible efforts to surround Russia, and even as the champion of maintaining and restructuring international financial system, who could but be embarrassed by what he said last week at the, about unbridled free markets at the G20 uh, meeting? All the people, people that are sitting there were embarrassed. Uh, but also the nature of the political space of the Republican Party inside the U.S. is a loss of legitimacy for that party. It's seen as very, very on the on, uh, 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 on a very uh, shrill, negative, sometimes even racist, uh, uh, lots of times even racist. And so the legitimacy of the role of the Republicans for, for as, as a ruling form for capital was severely questioned by the crisis. Although they seem to now have found new wheels as can be demonstrated by the not so veiled efforts to destroy what's left of the uh, post-war compromise in, in Congress. Obama will rule in the name of such a coalition, not the Republican coalition, the other one but with the dominance of capital and within its logic. He knows no other ones, and to think that there was, lurking behind the scenes, a real agenda of challenging capital while the rest was there just to simply get elected is, is silly. First, there's no reason to think that this was anywhere present. And second, even if there was, and a really important theme of analyzing change is that unless a political movement actually, especially when you're challenged, if you're challenging capital, has a strong base of people who know that they want to challenge capital and are ready for the for, for what capital is going to do, you can't make those changes. So I think that's really important and all the ex ex examples in the 70s and 80s to do that, in England and France and stuff like that, sh show that to be the case. But note that Obama's coalition is not a class-based phenomenon, even though it might have uh, uh, strategically contributed to building working class movements in certain ways. His coalition included, in the words of Dan Labatz, the American activist, what he called democratic, demographic segments of the population galvanized, galvanized by the media and by Obama's quiet charisma. I think it was, it was more conscious. They have a much more conscious effort to craft together a coalition that was free of class approaches, but included efforts to win over certain segments of the working class. It included the so-called new economy types and sectors based on new technologies, um, elements of Wall Street and the financial sector, reform-minded capital, urban and rural majorities of African Americans, although a lot of the slogging in the election was amongst white working class people because they were seen as swing voters. Uh, for the results, there clearly were successful efforts to move some of those people. And uh, if, if you read some of the analysis of what happened in, in some of these counties in Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, the swing states, they did change. This, but this, and what happened was a lot of middle, young middle class people were recruited 
but members of unions from other parts of the country. Uh, SEIU, African American women from SEIU in New York City, um, uh, um, steel workers, uh, auto workers from all over the country are brought, they volunteer to actually to go into these places to talk to their co-workers and try and break supposedly this notion of, uh, of social conservatism which, was, uh, which is, is one layer of it. And uh, it was very inclusive and, 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 and a very, very impressive process. And I read an article uh, in, in October by a, in the New Yorker, and I just want to quote you to give you a sense of, it's not just that workers are conservative, right? They had reason for not voting for Democrats, because the Democrats didn't do anything for them. And this is a, I want to quote, 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 quote this from you. Last year, four sociologists at the University of Arizona, led by Lane Kenworthy, released a paper that complicates the, the Frank's thesis, the thesis that workers are, are sort of dumb because they, uh, they, they, they put the cultural issues before economic issues. Their study followed the voting behavior of 45% of white Americans who identify themselves as working class. Mining electoral data from the General Social Survey, they found that the decline in white working class support for Democrats occurred in one period, from the mid-1970s until the early 90s, with a brief low in the early 80s, and it remained well below 50% ever since. But they concluded that social issues like abortion, guns, religion, and even outside the South, race, had little to do with that shift. Instead, according to their data, it was based on the judgment that during years in which industrial jobs went overseas, unions practically vanished, working class income stagnated, the Democratic Party did nothing for them. Beginning, the quote from their report is, beginning in the mid to late 70s, there were increasing reason for working class whites to question whether the Democrats were still better than the Republicans in promoting their well, well, material well-being. The study's authors write, working class whites, their fortunes falling, began to embrace the anti-government, low-tax rhetoric of the conservative movement. During Clinton's presidency, the downward economic spiral of these Americans was arrested briefly, but by then their identification with the Democrats had eroded. Having earlier moved to the right for economic reasons, the Arizona study concluded the working class stayed there because of the rising provenance of social issues. And later it said it would take years for it to change. I would say maybe it never will change. But those people were, in fact, it's one of the central, central places where the battle was fought for this election. So there are layers of social movement, as other social movement aspirations within the phenomenon that was the Obama campaign, but nowhere were the real social movements really happening. Fighting against foreclosures, defensive jobs, you didn't see that. And I heard, I was told that a lot of people in black, black communities, African American communities, purposely didn't want to organize anything because they didn't want to hurt Obama. I'm not sure what it, how, just how that, that is. But unless those things happen, change, change won't happen. There was also a series of references I want to mention to the potential rise in right-wing populism and its possible morphing into fascism. And in many liberal democratic circles in the United States, this is the only radicalism they can fathom. They talk about white or, or, or any workers becoming radical, they, they, they see it as, as moving to the right. On the other hand, respected radicals um, like Bill Fletcher Jr. and others are worried about the trend within U.S. political thinking with ties to the Republican right. But you couldn't miss a key point as you heard the right-wing populist appeals of Sarah Palin and her friends as they use references to working class people, really meaning good entrepreneurial uh, small business people, that no one was around to define class differently. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's really what the problem is there. Obama uses the language of unity of the American people. It was one of the things that led me to shut off his speech when I was riding my bike to Montreal in, in, in 19, 2004. And I heard this young African-American man giving the speech. It was a great rousing speech, but it was a liberal. Uh, it, the, the speech was pretty loud because it all talked about unity. <laughs> It didn't talk about fights or anything like that. He changed what he did in this one. But even in his victory speech in Chicago, he said, let us remember that if this financial crisis taught us anything, it's that we cannot have a thriving Wall Street while Main Street suffers. In this country, we rise or fall as one nation, as one people. Hardly the kind of rhetoric which is going to build anything. Even the Joel the Plumber persona that was so eloquently debunked in a number of places wasn't so much debunked by Obama. Instead, he claimed that the American dream can best be attained with the help of his tax program. Individual upward social mobility and a fairer playing field in a, in a private market economy is his promise. He also uses the language of bipartisan, par, bipartisanism and argues of the irrelevance of left and right. But, on the other hand, many progressives, in U.S. leftists and others, embrace the following narrative, and it's one which I think makes a lot of sense. Obama, even though he's a centrist politician, has mobilized, organized, and inspired a lot of different people. And that creates pr potential openings to go further. Francis Fox Piven, the highly respected social movement activist, analyst, and historian, put it this way. A campaign mobilization is almost surely too flimsy and too dependent on the candidate to generate a weighty pressure that can hold politicians accountable, I would add, even if they don't really want it to. 
Still the soaring rhetoric of that campaign, the slogans like, we are the ones who we have been waiting for, the huge, young, and enthusiastic crowds, all this generates hope, and hope fuels activism among people who otherwise accept politics as usual. Sometimes, encouraged by electoral shifts and campaign promises, the ordinary people, who are typically given short shrift in political calculation, become volatile and unruly, impatient with the same old promises and ruses, and they refuse to cooperate in the institutional routines that depend on their cooperation. When that happens, their issues acquire a white-hot urgency, and politicians have to respond because they are politicians. In other words, the disorder, the stoppages, and institutional breakdowns generated by this sort of collective action threaten politicians. These periods of mass defiance are unnerving, and many authoritative voices are even now pointing to the dangers of pushing the Obama administration too hard and too far. Yet these are also the moments when ordinary people enter into the political life of the country and authentic bottom-up reform becomes possible." Unquote. In the thinking of these people, a centrist such as Obama could be forced to move dramatically if there are such mass movements and discontent from below. They often compare this to what happened in 1932 with Roosevelt, who also started with a rather centrist, lackluster set of policies, but was forced to change in the face of ongoing economic misery and an array of mass movements and protests, the likes of which the company had, country had never seen before. Mass rent refusals in black neighborhoods, farmers and tenant farmers refusing to deliver crops at below production prices, mass strikes in the working class. And always, the role of anti-capitalists and socialists and communists of various sorts linking it all to the system itself and really being dedicated to change. But it's hard to see such a scenario unfolding today. But it would be strong, and, 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 and it would be strong, it would be impossible to totally discount it, but it's hard to see it happen. On the negative side, there is so far any lack of any bottom-up social movements around foreclosures, demanding jobs and income supports against urban decay, for that matter, union organizing drives. Just think about what's happening now in, in, the, uh, in the thing with auto. You don't hear the UAW organizing anything, any resistance. What you do hear is verbal resistance when, when, when Gettelfinger meets with, the, with, with Congress, but you don't see the mass movements coming up. It's a lack of, the other point is that there's a lack of organized political radicalism, particularly of the anti-capitalist kind, and it's almost total off, totally off the agenda, even as a small echo in a growing cacophony of voices around how to understand and respond to the crisis. On the positive side, though, we don't know. These things can never be predicted. Perhaps some of these movements have been waiting until the organ organization. Who knows? The massive organization around the election. There was a very massive organization, something that we, we, we've had very little experience with in the past. It theoretically can be transformed into something else. But who will do this? And what will it be transformed into? Even then, does it take the form of shock troops to support reforms that Obama will bring in, or autonomous pressure groups to force him to bring those things in? Or will it just dissipate? We don't know, but where's the leadership for these movements? Are anybody, is anybody articulating this? I haven't heard it. There is one realm in which Obama's election really does represent a step forward, even if it's mostly symbolic. People with African origins around the world celebrate this and are leading the rest of us to realize the fundamental truth here. That brings us to the question of what it means for, to fight for black equality and liberation in the United States. You know, the, the, majorities, that just, the majorities that Obama got amongst African Americans were Brezhnevian. Brezhnevian. That is, when Brezhnev used to run for the Communist Party, there was no opposition, he got 95% of the vote. Well, that's the level that, that, uh, that African Americans voted for Obama. And it happened in the major studies that in battleground states, the ones that were close, that it was these majorities that, that really put him over the top, even though Obama got 30 to 40% of so-called white voters in these places. There remains also tremendous uh, barriers that Obama had to overcome to get elected as an Afri African American person, and let's not forget these. These are some of the things that have to be addressed. In a country that in the past had used things like terror, literacy tests, poll taxes, property qualifications, they now use other things, like official documents for, for passports in order to vote, needing a stable ma mailing address. If you have any felony in your past, you can be disqualified for life, uh, and proportional to the population, you know these statistics. You, the United States leads the world in putting people behind bars and currently has 2.3 millions in its jails and prisons. Among inmates, black men and women outnumber Hispanics by more than 2 to 1 and whites by nearly 6 to 1. Blacks are disproportionately among either the 880,000 who are currently incarcerated or the 2 million who have served sentences but continue to be disenfranchised. 13% of black men can't cast votes and three states 20% can't because they're locked up or formally work. Those are really amazing things. They get, I'm not talking about changing them, I'm talking about how can you get elected in the face of this. He did. Really addressing racism though and equality would require more than electing a black president. Institutionalized racism in housing, education, job ghettos, and mass unemployment in urban centers and now suburban ghettos 
all relate to the power of capital to invest, possibly developing non-market forms of investment, as well as unfair ways of raising and dispersing taxes that require massive changes in class consciousness in order to change. All beyond what one would expect from a democratic administration and unthinkable without a movement pushing from below. These are some of the things that Martin Luther King tried to organ organize when he moved to Chicago in the North. And you might remember that those, those movements failed. He had to back off. Uh, then there's, there's other possibilities. There's the Employee Free Cho Choice Act, which is uh, um, a, uh, a law which Obama's committed to and the labor movement was pushing, which would make it easier to organize. They would get rid of the vote. They would beef up the National Labor Relations Board. And they would make it possible to organize. If they passed this, it could open up space for active sessions of the labor movement to make a breakthrough, perhaps in Walmart. And that's what happened when Roosevelt got elected. They passed this kind of legislation. And a lot of people felt, hmm, the government's behind us. Maybe we have some space to organize. And that movement took off, right? Maybe you'll have that kind of thing happening in, in, in the retail sector. I don't know. The deeper issues are, will Obama deliver? He's mentioned this guy, Banyar, as potential uh, the uh, labor minister, uh, secretary of labor. He's supposedly supporting that. Uh, but can a moribund US labor movement actually take advantage of it? Who knows? In the current debate about what to do in the auto sector, keep in mind this. There is a, this cacophony of cries for different strategies and outcomes. You turn the radio on, you hear something different every time. If you listen closely, you can still hear one shrill tone that's still there. And that's people who are saying, uh, get rid of the wage and benefit and pension incomes of workers in the auto sector. Break the labor movement. It'll destroy the capacity of the working class to fight back. And uh, not to, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, the, one of the former Republican uh, uh, no, uh, potential nominees, he had an uh, editorial in the New York Times a couple of days ago, and it was pretty clear what he was calling for. Um, we don't hear much from Obama about that. We assume he'd be opposed to that, but we're not, nothing's being mobilized today in terms of building for that, and that's a problem. Then there's Obama's foreign policy. On the war in Afghanistan, Obama suggests a pullout from Iraq, and uh, this was cited in the exit polls for his election, as well as moving to the center of moving, moving to Afghanistan, because that's the war that needs to be fought, because that's the war that will fight Al Qaeda. Uh, that's a problem. Right? That's a big problem. We don't really know. I mean, it's like the whole thing. If this is what he's committed to in his election, what's he going to do as president? On the other hand, he is committed to closing Guantanamo and ending torture and rendition, and he still wants special trial for prisoners, but this is still better than what Bush is doing. On the other hand, most of the people he's appointing have been part of Clinton's humanitarian imperialist and neoliberal approach, and done with, but even if it's done with a more multi, multilateral framework than Bush, and uh, a lot of these people have been part of Bush's entourage, except today, uh, they just, uh, he just said he's going to have Hillary Clinton. Obama will have to radically cut military spending if he wants to invest in fixing the horrible failing education systems and in major cities and promise health care programs, as well as new tech infrastructure programs. And remember, during the entire debate uh, he had with McCain, there was no mention about cutting military spending. And uh, uh, the education system is really a critical piece there. There's no mention of single payer health care. Uh, now the possibilities are being, some of the possibilities are being undermined by the Bush administration's lame duck days. You saw what they've been doing with the, with the bailout. And uh, Obama's not saying much. He said yet, well, you can't have two presidents. They should be mobilizing now. And there is a problem there. And just a couple of points. As the cabinet appointments go, one decent possibility for labor minister might be this fellow Bonnier, but the rest don't look promising. Most are from the Clinton era, including Hillary, are part of the new economic bloc. The new attorney general holder, the guy he's going to announce, defended Chiquita Banana against the Colombian protesters. This is the kind of folks that he's got there. Now, just a couple of points and then I'll finish. A good deal of this has to do with the nature of reform movements in the neoliberal era, even if they're just middle of the road like Obama's. We're all so much at the mercy of private markets today that anything you do to piss them off creates a choice. Either appease them, which means there's no reform, continue with the chosen course in which they will punish you, or have reforms which have no, have no content to them. Or you are forced to make them even more radical choices and build and mobilize a movement behind you to force them to back off. But you have to have created elements of this movement before you get elected in the process Otherwise, you're not who you, you have nobody here. To, you have nobody here to, to do this. People get scared away, and it's very, very important to make sure that it happens. What's needed in the U.S. is a political project to create a class-based <coughs> movement that dovetails with anti-racism, feminism, immigrant rights, the challenges to capitalism and imperialism. This is not happening. The question we've got to ask is: What is it in the current situation 
that might help the left in the U.S. move in that direction, specifically around the election of, about Obama. I'm not convinced that there's all that much there. However, there is some motion. A lot of, I'll just finish on the following point. A lot of what drove the radicalism of the left in the late 1960s, that's what I radicalized, I'd say in 1970, in 19, the year of 1970 was the year that I radicalized, before that I was in favor of the Vietnam War and all that kind of stuff. A lot of what, came, what got into that was frustration with the weakness and the pro-capitalist orientation of liberal politicians who promised change and really just delivered more of the same. I'm thinking about people like Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society, because remember, Lyndon Johnson ran in 1964, you know, couldn't remember, you weren't alive, most of it, against Barry Goldwater and over the issues of, of the war. We, we thought that was really important. There was Robert Kennedy. I was getting cynical by then, then, but a lot of people have made the comparisons between Robert Kennedy and about. Robert Kennedy ran on a semi-anti-war platform before he got assassinated, but, you know, and, and, and some kind of a, a help for people, in, uh, poor people in the cities. The people, a lot of the people who became radicals and end up dedicating their life to socialist ideas moved off because they saw that those people were going nowhere. And they were mobilized and they lost faith in that. Hopefully, this, this is one of the spaces for radicalism that will come to develop. You've noticed that it's mixed, my, 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 my perspective on this, because I think that the real, reality is mixed now. And uh, it depends upon, just, you know, upon how things are going to develop, whether we're going to move. Okay?